Start with a roll call, please. Here. Deputy Mayor Feller. Uh, Councilmember Kime. Here. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Sanchez. Here. And Deputy, Deputy Mayor Feller. Here. At this point, we, I would like to invite our uh, newly city clerk, Zeb Navarro, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we will do his uh, swearing in. Ready? Begin. Did you want to announce it? Peter, did you want to announce it? At, at this time, we will have a swearing in of Mr. Navarro. I, Zeb Navarro, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office of the city clerk of the city of Oceanside according to the best of my ability. Thank you. I just wanted to thank uh, everybody that's reached out and uh, congratulated me and sent well wishes and I just want to send a huge thank you to the city staff especially the wonderful staff in the city clerk's office. I couldn't have asked for a better staff than the ones I got. Um, I am here to serve you and serve the citizens of Oceanside, and I thank you all for your support. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Emerald from the chamber to come forward for the business spotlight. On behalf of the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to invite Robin Carlson of Carlson Mobile Notary to come up and be recognized as our Member of the Month for February. Robin has been a member of our Chamber for over seven years now. She started her business in 2009 and offers an array of notary services to the areas of Oceanside, Fallbrook, Bonsall, and more. We thank Robin for her support over the years and her generosity in donating um, numerous raffle prizes which helped raise funds for local area nonprofits at chamber events. Robin has always supported her fellow members, always making sure new members and newcomers are welcome um, and guides others to resources that are beneficial to them. She's a great example of a model chamber member and a citizen here of Oceanside. She's, a, not she's <clears throat> excuse me, a member in good standing with the National Notary Association a class, and a classified employee um, substitute of the Oceanside Unified School District. And for those of you that don't know Robin yet, you'll soon not forget her as she has the catchiest tagline in town. <laughs> and with that, I'll let her share that with you. I want to thank the Oceanside City of Chamber for recognizing me and prom my promoting services for the city. 25 years of residency for my, me and my husband, supporting and raising a Oceanside High School graduate pirate 2016, as well as promoting my business, Carlson Mobile Notary. Thank you. Go Pirates. 
as a mobile notary and a certified signing agent, I travel to mutually agreed upon signing locations in San Diego North County. I've got 30 years of experience in the real estate industry. My expertise is in home loan signings, FHA, VA, conventional, and reverse. I also have general notary experience dealing with trust, standalone documents such as affidavits, homeowner association documents, pensions, 401ks, and affidavits. So whether you are in need of a major loan signing documents or just a standalone single, Robin Carlson, Carlson Mobile Notary. Remember me for notary. Thank you very much. Mr. Mullen. Thank you. The City Council met at 3.30 in closed session to discuss item one on the closed session agenda, which was a conference with labor negotiator involving the status of negotiations with the Oceanside Police Officers Association. Uh, the council did meet and get direction on that, or give direction on that item, but there is no action to report under the Brown Act at this time. This time we have our consent calendar. Uh, Councilmember Sanchez. Sorry, uh, move approval. Um, I understand that 15 is being pulled. Um, so, and uh, I like the record to reflect that I'm recusing myself on item number 16, but move approval for balance. Councilmember Rodriguez. I'd like to pull item number three. I'll second that motion. So please vote on the balance with the exception. So is there a public on? A public has pulled item number 15. 15, okay. And please That's vote on the balance. Motion passes, 5-0. Councilmember Rodriguez on three. Our February 6th um, meeting agenda, I'm showing on item number 21 in reference to the council agenda item brought forth for the homeless work program. Uh, I'm showing a 5-0 approved. And from my recollection, Esther Sanchez voted no on That's that. That's correct. So if that's a motion to correct the minutes, I would second that. Do we even need a motion for that? Please vote. We have a member of the public for 15. If you want to call them, please. First speaker is Gloria Vasquez followed by Don Heron. I'm a resident of Costa Serena, a senior community in Oceanside. I have a letter written by one of our residents regarding um, item 15. So there are approximately 90 units that will be directly affected by this development, especially traffic. The original houses on that property were torn down because of traffic safety issues. I feel this should be addressed before the property is sold as we have a serious traffic problem at Buena Hills and Vista Way, uh, that is with U-turns. So when we asked why they could not add a U-turn lane, we were told there is not enough room. So it sounds like somewhere down the road, this piece of land may be needed to widen the road at that spot. Since this property does not need to be sold, why not keep it and see what develops with all the traffic which is now using Vista Way. In the rush hour periods, it is like a freeway now. While it is being sold as senior only, 
who and how will this be enforced? We had a very expensive age violation lawsuit with a developer that ended in the fourth district court in San Diego where we won and it set a precedent for California. Um, Nancy Porter was on the board at that time and while we have an excellent age violator board member, she is she has approximately one to three cases of violations a month, the last one ending in court. Who and how will they handle this? I noted contract states, owners, and rentals. Do they plan to have a board and DORs? Who will enforce this? As we can tell you, it is a constant problem with age violations. Also parking, where will they park their extra cars, especially rental units, the adjoining streets are parking restricted? Well, I know these issues are not supposedly not relevant until they submit a plan. In our case, because they are, once the plans are out, we will have to end up having to fight issues that should have been considered before the property was sold. Had we known this beforehand, at least approximately 90 units directly affected, mine included, we could have requested that the council address some of these questions before there were multiple problems. Thank you. Next speaker is Don Heron, followed by Steve Rolf. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Well, good evening, Council. Yes, my name is Don Heron. I also live in Costa Serena. And I found out about this project yesterday. I don't know what stage this project's in, but I'll just repeat what Gloria stated that the homes that used to be in there because of the traffic on Vista Way, the homes that were in that little area were removed because of the traffic. And I want to add to uh, the city that's being added or the fortress that's being added on the south side of 78 Highway in Carlsbad. I'm not sure if there's 1,600 homes going in there or 1,600 condos. But Carlsbad is only allowing all that traffic to come out on College Boulevard, which is in Oceanside. If they want to get to El Camino Real, they have to make a left off a of college and go down Vista Way. Right now, it's a freeway going down Vista Way. They go about 70 miles an hour, even if they have to miss, run two red lights to get from college to El Camino Real. Once that fortress is fully occupied over there in Carlsbad, their only entrance is out to College Boulevard, and they will take up um, more traffic down Vista Way than it will occupy at this point in time. I think in the foresight, I think that Vista Way and that little area in there needs to have go from two lanes to three lanes. I think that's more of the foresight there. That little cubby hole of land where they want to put 18 or nine, nine to 18 units in there, it's barely big enough for a small dog park. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Steve Rolf or Ralph? Ralph. Ralph, sorry. Good evening, City Council and Mayors. Uh, Mayor, excuse me. I uh, just wanted to make a couple of comments here. I am, uh, I have been working with the Pacific Group in uh, trying to work with the city and with Vicki Gutierrez of your staff to uh, uh, try to uh, put this together as a sale. Um, the, the project previously, or where the homes were previously, uh, the reason I think the city condemned them and took them is for the widening of the street. Also the fact that all those homes, or most of those homes, uh, had e ingress and egress directly onto Vista Way, which was pretty dangerous. I, I need to clarify for everybody that this property is unentitled, it's raw land. There is no project right now. So what uh, we were trying to do is trying to make uh, well, chicken soup out of something else, okay? Well, anyway, trying to do something uh, beneficial for the city. Um, 
and for the developer, of course. But, but everything will be checked, rechecked, everything will be uh, okayed by city staff, by the planning department. Um, they'll make it a, uh, a good project so that it won't have any impacts, hopefully. We're talking about between nine and 18 units. The property is restricted because of its, its geography, because of the plot plan of it. Uh, there would probably be much fewer units than, than the 18 that uh, could be envisioned there and are actually zoned that way. Uh, the developer plans on keeping it a senior as it's restricted under CCNRs and to one level as it's restricted under CCNRs. So I'm certain that the city will, uh, will make sure that all the other boxes are checked before approving this project. Um, so we uh, hope you will see it our way and, and uh, that we'll be turning uh, what's weeds right now into some new senior housing for the community. Thank you. There's no more speakers on this. Councilmember Sanchez. Thank you. Uh, I have been working with the Costa Serena community for uh, quite a long time um, through all kinds of um, uh, problems uh, with the development, um, with traffic, uh, with the parking issues. That was the most recent. And I know that uh, many of them walk along Vista Way. Uh, yes, it's true. This, there were several homes um, in this area and they were condemned by the city uh, because of the widening of Vista Way. And uh, so this is the part, this is like a little, it's two acres, a, thin, a, a very thin slice of, of land. And I know that there had been discussions um, by members of Costa Serena to come to the city and talk about a park um, because uh, they, there is no uh, common area in this for Costa Serena. They, they were able to, they're able to continue as a senior community um, and, and they use the Vista Way to, to walk. Now, there's a lot of issues with the development on the other side and, and a lot of uh, speeding and running of red, red lights. Um, so those would have to be, you know, they, they do need to be addressed um, independent of this project. Um, it, it would have been nice now since the city had ownership of this, um, you know, we ended up with ownership of this strip of land um, to look into the potential for a, a, a park. Um, so I, I feel that that's something we should have been able to discuss um, before talking about selling. So I'm gonna be uh, voting against this, thank you. Councilmember Rodriguez. <clears throat> Talking about it being a park should have been done by now, in my opinion. Um, we are short on senior housing, so I look forward to seeing uh, the sale go through and um, what we can do with this land to add more senior housing to Oceanside. Is that a motion? That is a motion to move forward on item 15. I'll second that. Seeing no other speakers, please vote. Motion approved, 4-1, Sanchez no. If we can go to 23, please. <clears throat> Item number 23, advance written request to reserve time to speak by Ms. Leslie Brooks regarding the Caltrans property, which was the original footprint of the Jeffries Ranch Road alternative access road. The property is going to auction April 3rd. 2019. Is Ms. Brooks here? Yes. Yes, yeah, so you know, on the agenda it said after 6 o'clock, so I'm sorry. Do you need some time? <laughs> Leslie, you don't need to fill out Brooks. a paper. You, this Ms. is an advanced Ms. request to speak. Yes. So you don't need to fill out another piece uh, of paper. You, you can just come up and speak.
Sorry, this caught me off guard. Um, anyway, hello. Nice to see you all again so soon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. We are, can you hear me okay? We are here to discuss the Caltrans property south and east of Jeffreys Ranch Road. This property is on the list of Caltrans excess properties that is slated for auction April 3rd, 2019. The history and timeline of Jeffreys Ranch Road is well documented in the City of Oceanside staff report dated January 4th, 2012. Due to the widening of State Route 76, Jeffreys Ranch Road was closed much to the concern of neighborhood residents. The City understood this concern and commissioned a feasibility study to identify alternative roadways to restore the public access. The feasibility study identified three alternative roadways. The City selected the right turn in out alternative. RBF consulting firm was selected to be the consultant. The scope of work was identified and the city agreed to the contract price of $130,740. After the study was completed and submitted, we were told that Caltrans would not approve the right turn in out alternative, and that was six years ago. This morning I spoke with Gary Warkington, Senior Vice President of RBF Consulting. He was one of the signers on the agreement contract and a signer on the Notary Public. California all-purpose acknowledgement form. He said RBF provided the work on behalf of the city and Caltrans. I looked on the city's website and could not find their report. I would very much like to see their report. Mr. Warkington and I discussed Caltrans guidelines and those, and from what he said, they are to minimize conflict and use intersection consolidated point of access. Another identified alternative roadway is a two-way roadway that would intersect the traffic signal at Sing Way. This alternative would be within Caltrans guidelines. The estimated cost of this alternative is in the area of $3 million. Today I am asked the city to enter into an agreement with Caltrans while we still have the opportunity to purchase this property and continue the process to restore the public access to Jeffreys Ranch Road for whichever alternative we can have. I appreciate the city's efforts on behalf of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any speakers on 24? We have six speakers on 24. First speaker is Ken Layton, to be followed by Joe Hill. Ken Layton, South O, speaking only for myself. Mayor Weiss and council members and Zeb, uh, I spent four consecutive council meetings imploring you to do what, uh, what you could to make sure that any future city treasurer would have a basic knowledge of the world of municipal investments so the city could retain and build on its $350 million investment portfolio. Maybe my rants mattered, maybe they didn't. But I thank you for instructing staff last week to figure out how to make this position an appointed one. Now Oceanside will hopefully become like every other charter city and get a treasurer who can understand the complexities of that position. Like a big pothole, you identified the problem and you took action to fix it. Good job. Now let me take another swing at the plate. Question, what's worse than a city council majority who defied every single neighbor who spoke and voted yes on a five-story, 99-room so-called prison hotel perched on a radically sloping hillside? Answer, an attorney who, in the name of standing up for the neighborhood, sues the developer to make the project better, but then settles the suit after only minor changes were made to the plans. The Fairfield Inn remains a 99-room, five-story train wreck by the sea. And that attorney walks away with what I am told is a six-figure settlement. But no neighbors were brought in to the settlement discussions. And because it was secret, no one will ever know what that attorney walked away with. It's all a big secret. What a scam. The planned hotel remains a hideous tenement dump and the developer can write off the payout as the cost of doing business in Oceanside. 
pretty creepy. Uh, but apparently, when I spoke about this at a recent OCNA meeting, the attorney responsible for that suit and who took the money and ran was in the audience and immediately ran out of the room when I brought this subject up like a cockroach running from light. And this is not the first time that local attorney used a local development as an ATM machine. She also sued over the Viastoria project. The upshot then, like the Fairfield Inn, only minor changes were made to the plans and the attorney got a reported six-figure payout. Creepy six-figure secret scams made in the name of preserving our quality of life. Please look into this creepy but legal scam and do what you can do to stop it in the future. Thank you. Next, speak next speaker is Joe Hill to be followed by Arlene Hammerschmidt. He's talking six figures, we're gonna talk seven figures. <laughs> just in case anyone, just in case anyone has forgotten, Mr. Mayor, city council members. <clears throat> Last year at the, in the 2018 election, because of a lot of media disinformation and spending a million two hundred and two thousand dollars, Measure Y was defeated. And that's fine, it's, it's an election and it, 65,000 people voted, so it got defeated. The problem is, is they haven't gone away yet. And what I found interesting was the, in the business journal, our Chamber of Commerce is taking full credit for defeating Measure Y. Interesting. If you read the article, the magazine's out in the lobby if you haven't seen it, but uh, they're claiming full credit that they're responsible for making sure that Y was defeated. As you see at the top there, Defeat and Measure Y highlights the impactful year for the City Chamber of Commerce. So they're still here. We now have full color ads in another local magazine. This is also integral, NRF, North River Farms. We have uh, private meetings for supporters that are going on. We have uh, visits to political meetings going on by North River Farms folks. And what's really interesting is yesterday, uh, the Building Association of San Diego is now asking for supporters to come from here, there, or wherever they determine that they're going to be to come to the meeting on the 13th to talk. Maybe they'll be from here, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll be like the people in Carlsbad when they had their big project going and just pay people to come talk and support. So I just want to make sure that everyone is cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, individuals who are taking the, taking the mantle and trying to, to push for, for this project on Oceanside. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Arlene Hammerschmidt to be followed by Michael Odegaard. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council, and City Clerk, Arlene Hammerschmidt speaking tonight as co-leader of Represent Oceanside. As a local chapter of Represent Us, Represent Oceanside is a grassroots, nonpartisan, unified, diverse group. We advocate protection of every resident's right to an equal voice and impartial, transparent government governance for the public good by holding City of Oceanside staff and officials to the highest ethical and legal standards. We never support or oppose any political party or candidate. Our mission behooves us to bring forward several concerns regarding the motion directing staff to make a presentation to council on the process to change both the city treasurer and the city clerk from elected to appointed positions, which was made at council's February 20th workshop to appoint a successor city clerk. 
Did residents have a voice? Was this action impartial, transparent governance? Did council maintain the highest ethical and legal standards? A motion on an off agenda issue was made and voted upon by council. Public was not informed of the item <clears throat> and was therefore denied information access to council's actions. Council member Sanchez addressed the issues of public access during the discussion of the motion. No request for public comment on the item before council voted. Additionally, council failed to follow city council policy 100-03 regarding off agenda items for its own meetings. The goal of this policy is likely to keep council safe from Brown Act violations. This off agenda motion has the appearance of a potential violation of the act by using the directive vote to sidestep the act and use of this directive vote as an instrument to gauge council's status for a future potential measure. Continuing this method of gauging council support for a future measure would become a legal liability if it becomes a pattern. Criteria for considering an off agenda item set forth by the city council in that policy were not met. In other words, this policy, 100.03, are, in the words of the Brown Act, the rules or procedures of the legislative body, this legislative body. Mr. Mullen just provided me with the Brown Act and highlighted a certain section. Um, the point of which I'm making is it's all subject to the rules or procedures of the legislative body, which we are set forward in the manual. I will respect your time, and Mr. Odegaard will finish the message. Right there. Thank you. Michael Odegaard, <clears throat> 959 Vine Street, also member of Represent Oceanside. Criteria for considering an off agenda item set forth in City Council Policy 100-03 were not met, that it was not an emergency situation. Number two, did Council determine a need to take action on the item that arose after the agenda was posted? That is unclear. Council did not identify any specific reasons connected with determining this need. Council did not make a separate motion that included the reasons for determining that need. If the need of this off agenda motion arose after the agenda was posted and the workshop was specifically and only to appoint a city clerk, then the office of city treasurer should not have been included in the motion. The item was not included in an agenda for a prior meeting and continued to this meeting. Additionally, any reasons for determining the need for a separate motion were not identified. Council minutes do not include any reasons for the motion. Therefore, the public remains uninformed. Failures to uphold City Council Policy Manual 100-03 that occurred during the Council's February 20th, 2019 workshop to appoint a successor city clerk are shown uh, in bold and underlined. It is, in this uh, letter is in your uh, email boxes there. It is the position of Representative Oceanside that the residents did not have a voice in this action and this action did not depict impartial transparent governance. Council fell far short of addressing the issue as an ethical and transparent process. It is our hope that bringing these issues to your attention will lead to readdressing the issue with a fully transparent and ethical, open public process. Thank you. The next speaker is Cindy oh, Rocco. Uh, Mr. Mullen has a comment. The mayor wanted me to clarify. Uh, the without deliberating on this because it's an off agenda matter. The Brown Act does specifically allow the city council to direct staff to place an item on a future agenda. And that was the nature <coughs> of the motion at the meeting that is being discussed. Staff will be coming back on March 27th to discuss um, options that are available to the city council to make the city clerk and or the city treasurer positions elect, uh, appointed if that's your desire or, or to keep them elected. Um, and, and so that will be an agendized meeting and the members of the public will have the opportunity to discuss um, whatever comments they want to provide to the council at that time. And if it is the desire to the council to move forward with a ballot measure, then that would come forward at yet another city council meeting. 
And furthermore, um, the Brown Act section that allows the council to direct staff to place an item at a future meeting is also in Chapter 2 of the Oceanside City Code. So those are our local procedures that specifically allow that. Now, whether that's good policy or bad policy, I'll leave to you, but it is something that you're allowed to do. Hi, uh, Cindy Rocco, Honorable Mayor, Council. I also am a member of Represent Oceanside, and I fully support our, we just have our, e kind of our eyes open and our ears alert to things that appear to be anomalies or happening at odd times. And I think that's a lot why we're bringing up why was a motion made during a meeting that's at a city council workshop that's really an interview that's for city council and then we start manipulating that towards questions that directly ask you know what if we go from election to appointment on these two positions and then all of a sudden as uh, me speaking as a citizen is I go oh wait a minute so now we're talking about possibility of having an election in 20 March of 2020 to let it put to the voters whether we're going to appoint or elect city clerks and treasurers and yes we can come up with requirements and you know minimum requirements for people that run and hopefully the elected body we don't want to lose another opportunity for the people to have a voice you can't strip away two more but that's a whole other issue you can you can study that but the part i'm appalled as as an, a citizen is that somehow in march of 2020 we will be able to have if we put our minds to it have an election to say yay or nay to appointing treasurer or city clerk, and I look around and I say, wow, and it's no offense, but we have two of our five uh, elected officials are appointees already, and we don't seem to be able to have an election affordability issue, or we do have an affordability issue when it comes to a mayor, but now we're not going to have an affordability issue when it comes to $750,000 to be spent in March of 2020 for an election. So I just think there's a lot of personal issues going on as far as what qualifies a treasurer or a clerk, et cetera, but that laundry has to be washed somewhere else. You cannot take away a Another elected position away from the people no matter what thank you next speaker is Jimmy not Jimmy Knott, 127 Sherry Lane. Uh, first off, I want to inform the public that on Monday, March 4th, there is going to be a, um, well, a ECAE and CAP meeting. This is an opportunity for the public to take and have input into the climate action plan. That meeting will be held uh, here in council chambers and as it says on there, very simply, that uh, it will be held 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And second part of it, I too have joined and represent us, and I saw an anomaly at the appointment meeting. And normally in the procedure, and I've sat here for over 25 years, and I've seen how council operates. Normally it's either the city manager or the city attorney. They hear from the council for a directive to be put onto the agenda. Normally it's not a vote. This is, that was real odd. And in the past, when I have actually heard a vote that was not on the agenda, I've stood up, I've come to the podium, and I've complained. And I've said very simply, the public has a right to speak on off-agenda items when you decide to violate the law and bring up an item that's not on the agenda. That's the consequences. You need to take and think about the public's right to participate in their government. If you do take a vote, now if you don't want to take a vote, just bring the idea forward to your hired help. That's the reason why they get the big bucks. They take and help you initiate 
your agendas. Over the years, many, many, many times, and our mayor has been around long enough, and so has uh, Esther, who was right in bringing him forward, and I was surprised that Jack did not take and open his mouth. But the thing is, the other two the gentlemen here, I can give you a little leeway. You're taking and learning as you go along. I've sat here, I've seen it how it's operated. I know how it's been. Please bring the public in. It's our government. It's not yours alone. Thank you. No more speakers. Are there any general council member comments? Mr. Mullen, you want to do 25? Yes, item 25 is the second reading and adoption of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Oceanside adopting ZA 1600010 with California Coastal Commission suggested modifications. Councilmember Sanchez. Move adoption. We have a motion and a second, please vote. Motion approves, 5-0. So we will take a short break until 6 o'clock when we will reconvene for our public hearing item. I'm Gary Kellison with the Development Services Department. The item before you is a resolution amending the Transnet Local Street Improvement Program of Projects for fiscal years 2019 through 2023. The um, Transnet, uh, uh, the RTIP, is a regional plan that's a short-term spending plan across the region. For Oceanside, we have each city, including Oceanside, has a program of projects that are submitted in the RTIP. RTIP is a two-year program. The city council last approved the two-year RTIP in June of 2018. So this amendment is like a mid-course correction where funding can be adjusted uh, for various projects to, uh, uh, as needed, where projects can be accelerated or need to be accelerated, and other projects uh, don't require the funding that was immediately provided. The, um, um, the RTIP program, or the, um, this amendment, controls the amount of money that we receive as we complete the projects, which is the flip side of the CIP budget, which is the council's direction on which projects will have expenditures uh, for the coming year. Uh, the major projects in the RTIP overall include, of course, the Quiet Zone project, which is under construction now, the city's uh, overlay program where we repave streets throughout the city, um, neither of these, these uh, two projects are in the amendment because staff is proposing no changes uh, in the two projects. They're fine as they originally were adopted by the council back in June of last year. In April, this coming April, staff will be back with a public hearing and a resolution to ask the council to give direction on approving our SB1 funding program for the coming fiscal year. That's a state requirement and is part of the open uh, policy on, uh, on um, good stewardship of the state SB1 money. So SB1, by contrast, will emphasize street maintenance very heavily. There will be slurry seals and overlay program support for to keeping our streets well maintained. Transnet covers expansion of streets as well as maintaining streets. Some of the specifics of the projects um, add additional um, funding to support studies for the seismic retrofit program, um, a bridge retrofit program between Pacific Street and the pier, which is in need of rehabilitation. So these are preliminary studies to support grant opportunities down the road. Um, I can, um, when I 
adjourn to questions. I can ask, ask answer specific questions on individual projects as the council has them. But this is the overall summary. Attached to the resolution is a very specific list year by year of the funding for each project that is proposed for amendment. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing if there's anyone that wishes to address this specific item. Oh. You mean not? Okay. Mayor, council members, Jimmy Knott 127, Sherry Lane. Um, I first want to thank uh, Gary here. He answered one of my questions uh, during the break, and that was regarding the coastal rail trail and the pedestrian bridge over the Low Malta Creek. Uh, slated for decreased funding. Uh, the reason why is very simple. The grant funding did not go through. It's still alive on the books. It's not been eliminated, but uh, it's still alive. It's just that it has to go through another process of uh, application for funding. But uh, there's two uh, other items. One is the traffic circles at Cassidy and also at Morse. Uh, South O has gone on record and uh, th basically uh, they don't like the idea of having traffic circles in our neck of the woods. Um, it could impact many of the local businesses. One of them is uh, like the Beach Break Cafe that you know it has been built over the last few years here and it would utterly destroy that corner and really affect the traffic situation there. So if those two could be removed from that list somehow, uh, it would be very much assurance to the community uh, that uh, the community has been listened to. If you doubt it, uh, you can contact, come to the South O meeting and hear from us. Uh, I would uh, suggest that you come to our meeting and hear from the South Oak uh, business uh, community and uh, public. And eventually, do get that rail trail and pedestrian bridge because it's needed for public safety. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Seeing no one else, we will close the public hearing and come back to the City Council. Councilmember Sanchez. Thank you. Yeah, I do see that there are runabouts um, uh, defined in, um, on page three on top, the project description. It talks about um, from Coast Highway from Bridge over the San Luis Rey River to the southerly city limit perform studies to reduce the four lane roadway to two lanes with bike lanes, on street parking and runabouts at the following cross streets. And then it lists SR 76 for Surfrider Civic Center, Pierview, Michigan, Wisconsin, Oceanside Boulevard, Moore Street and Cassidy Street. Um, and that's why the, there's an increased um, in request for increasing funding. I understand this is coming to the council. Um, is, it, is it possible that any uh, that we could uh, put this off until after after the uh, coast highway um, project is vetted by the council to uh, before any money is spent on this. Um, and yes, it's any uh, council member uh, Sanchez, uh, mayor, and uh, res the uh, council members. Of course, anything is possible according to council's direction. I would recommend, though, approval at this at tonight's meeting. Uh, and I'll let me explain what's going on with the description you read in the. Because uh, that's a million dollars, right? That's, pardon me. The estimated total cost is one one million, right? Yes. Okay. Um, that again is reflected the, that it's a planning. Uh, document and staff had to submit to uh, Sandag the idea 
uh, maybe a best guesstimate of the configuration of South Coast Highway, including the traffic signals, because Sandag staff report includes an air conformity analysis, which is dependent on the exact lane configuration and traffic signal versus traffic circle. The project itself will have an EIR available for public comment this summer, and I'm sure the public will have an input in planning, first the Planning Commission, City Council, on what configuration uh, to make the project. At that point, if it changes significantly what was written in the RTIP description that uh, you've read, um, there would have to be another transnet amendment to uh, make the description of the project conform with what's actually going to be built. At this stage, there's no construction money um, in the RTIP for South Coast Highway. It's merely planning studies design. And um, so we have an opportunity, of course, to make the project description match what is ultimately approved by the city. Thank you, Gary. Um, I guess my concern is um, uh, spending money that on, on a project that we're not really sure yet whether it's, it's, uh, it's, it's got support. Um, could, Gary, could, could you also tell me the status of the Coastal Rail Trail? Uh, looks like you're looking for grant money. Um, this is something that's long overdue. So. Absolutely. Um, we were hopeful to get a grant in the current year with construction phase money. That did not happen. Um, that's why the reduction in money for the, um, the uh, South Coast um, the trail extension over uh, Lone Malta Creek. The remaining funds are sufficient to reapply for a Sandag uh, grant and uh, can just continue the efforts of winning that, uh, the money we needed for the project. Is it like $7 million or something? Yes. Um, as a follow-up, if there is a specific project in the, uh, among the group of projects proposed for amendment that is a difficulty with the council or prefer that it be not included, I would ask that City Council give direction to modify the resolution to exclude or include that specific project. Are you now back to the Coast Highway? Yes. Okay. Well, I do, I do want to call out on the annual slurry seal project for the public's um, if, if the public hasn't had a chance to look at the staff report, uh, we're talking about the downtown area for this coming year. Is it the two years? Yes. Okay, two years. It's the downtown area, Loma Alta, uh, River Meadows, Fire Mountain, Henny Hills, Del Oro Hills, Ivy Ranch, and RDO Village. So those are the areas that are scheduled for uh, this this year and, and next year's annual slurry seal projects. Um, and I would like us to consider um, putting the funds on hold for those parts, for that part that has to do with the Coast Highway um, that it anticipates roundabouts, um, which we're not clear yet whether or not that has um, um, that is going to be approved by the council. So I move uh, adoption, but would ask the council to consider deleting that part at this point. Councilmember Rodriguez. I also have comments in reference to the uh, slurry seal improvements. Um, I see for physical year 2020 to 2021, it's been decreased by 432,000. And fiscal year 21 to 22, it's been decreased by over 200,000. Um, I do know, in, in speaking to, um, to staff about this program, that there's a pavement management uh, program that allocates what roads are done and, and not, depending on the age, and just to get the best use out of them. However, I, I am in District 2, and I do notice that uh, we're kind of getting the uh, low end of the slurry uh, in the next couple years, and um, and I see extra funds, so I just wanted to kind of elaborate on that and 
and if you could elaborate on that more on why those are being decreased. I'm glad to uh, Council Member Rodriguez, uh, Mayor Weiss, and the remainder of the uh, City Council. Um, the timing of this amendment is somewhat awkward. It's dictated not so much by the logic of where the count, where staff would like to present things, but rather by uh, sandag deadlines for adopting uh, actions which are driven by accounting. Uh, staff will return in April with an overall view of the uh, asphalt slurry seal program and the asphalt overlay program with a look of how we balance work across the uh, council districts. Then the overall um, slurry seal program actually will have a net increase when we're done with the adoption, with programming SB1 money to slurry seal, right. which will help SB1. and allow us to uh, add additional streets. Uh, when that's adopted, there's a separate SB1 list that will be attached to that resolution as well. Got it. So is there a backup list at some point we'll be able to see that shows what's coming up next with those SB1 funds? Yes. Okay. Because I would like to report back to my district that uh, we're going to have some fresh slurry seal because it doesn't look like we're getting much with this first round. So I look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Mr. Kellison, I have a question for you. When you look at the next 20 years of transnet funding, uh, generally uh, about how much total would we be getting that's not currently committed to projects? Uh, Mayor Weiss, council members, uh, in all fairness, uh, Mayor gave me a preview that the question would be asked, so at least I came prepared. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, the transnet uh, our transnet revenues are traditionally split 70% for new projects, 30% for maintaining our existing road infrastructure. If we just look at that 70% new slice and in inflate our revenue at a very conservative 1% annually, uh, because that's the maybe the general increase in sales tax revenues throughout the county, cumulatively, by the year 2040, which is actually 22 years in the, in, the dis, in the future, we would have accumulated $91 million for road work or for road infrastructure, new construction. Thank you. Councilmember Feller. Thank you. I got my numbers backwards. I, did, I said 19, but it was 91. <laughs> um, so, so while I'm not overly supportive of the Coast Highway Vision Plan. I think uh, we need to have due justice on the vision and the, the, uh, the, the things that you need to put out there for the EIR, which will be out later this year. Um, you know, I know South Oceanside doesn't want any uh, changes. And what? Did you have something to say? They don't want any roundabouts. They don't want any narrowing either. Um, they, they want uh, things as it is. Um, but I think we need to develop the plan and then hear from the public on, on uh, that. So I do not support taking the, uh, any of the project apart at this point. Otherwise, I'd just say take it out completely because I'm really not in favor of the, the project. And it's, uh, you know, I think there's some benefits for density bonus and those kinds of things that come along uh, with uh, having having a, a denser corridor but uh, at this point I'm, I'm willing to go along with it so I'll make the motion that we uh, follow staff recommendation I also want to say there's 128 streets I counted them up that are getting this the this uh, slurry seal and uh, that can make a big difference um, 
before you were paying attention, they had a they had quite a bit of attention on North River Road and Douglas, and and so at at some point you'll you'll get your share too. But other parts of the city have struggled. So anyway, I make the motion that we support staff recommendation. I second that. Point, point of order. I did make the motion. I actually was uh, the motion to adopt the resolution. All right. Uh, I'll make a substitute motion. There's but no wasn't your motion to remove an My item? My motion was to adopt the resolution and that we consider removing that. We consider. Obviously, we're not, we're not. considering it. So are you making the motion to adopt then yes. as it is? Okay. Okay. I'll second. Please vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Okay, we had uh, three off agenda items that were thought to be part of this last public hearing item, but they were not, so they weren't called, so we will go back to those three. And, and I do apologize. Um, our first speaker up is Roger Davenport, to be followed by Catherine Bartlett. So, Mr. Mayor, council members, staff, and fellow citizens, good evening. My name is Roger Davenport, live at 541 Crouch Street in Oceanside, and I want to apologize. We didn't catch number 24 on the agenda, so we marked our, our thing wrong about speaking. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Community Choice Energy tonight. First, I wholeheartedly agree with Council Member Rodriguez, who this past Monday posted online how, quote, it's so important that members of our community know the truth about community choice aggregation, which is another name for CCE. So in that vein, I urge the City Council to conduct a public hearing and presentation as soon as possible on the results of the CCE technical feasibility study that Oceanside participated in along with Encinitas, Carlsbad, and Del Mar. A draft of that study happened to be released on 20 February by Encinitas as they officially received it and voted to move ahead with the next steps towards implementing CCE. I think the summary from that report speaks for itself. <clears throat> This study concludes that the formation of a CCE in the partner cities is financially feasible and could yield considerable benefits for all participating residents and businesses. These benefits could include 2% lower rates for electricity, although higher rate reductions are possible. The positive impacts on the partner cities and their inhabitants of forming a CCE suggest that this effort should be considered. No likely combination of sensitivities or launch schedules would change this recommendation based on a detailed analysis of currently available data. So the movement to CCE in our area is accelerating. The city of San Diego voted on Monday to proceed with formation of a CCE program. The county of San Diego voted yesterday to investigate CCE. Oceanside and its neighboring cities are poised to be at the forefront of this movement. So let's get everybody up to speed by having a hearing on the technical study ASAP and get to it. Thank you for your attention. Next speaker is Catherine Bartlett to be followed by John Bruner. Good evening, my name is Catherine, and I live over at 200 North El Camino Real, which is the uh, Rancho San Luis um, mobile home. And I just want to um, address uh, you, um, I wanted to speak on behalf of the Community Choice Energy, which I think is a good one. And my understanding is that some of the other cities like Encinitas, Carlsbad, they've already addressed it in their council uh, meetings. And apparently, from what I understand, they haven't quite addressed it here in Oceanside. I think it's a very good initiative. I think it should be addressed, have people come, let them know what they think, and hopefully you can make up your mind that this would be a good 
good thing to have. Um, I always believe that there should be diversity in anything, especially if we only have one provider, I guess. We still have the San Diego Gas and Electric, uh, not to belittle them. They're providing the service that we need, but we also need to look at other things where uh, when we pay our bills, maybe it'll lower it. Uh, for the people, the, the money that normally that uh, we would pay for higher bills, that money would go to something for the local communities. They can uh, branch out with that money and uh, start uh, other things that would be beneficial. So I do, and I also, uh, the previous speaker, I uh, also agree with him, and I'm hoping that you give this consideration um, you know, what you can among all the other concerns and items that we come after you. But I do appreciate your time and uh, letting me speak, speak to this, okay? Thank you. Our next speaker is John Bruner. <laughs> Good evening. My name's JP. I'm the co-lead of the Climate Change Committee for the Surfire Foundation, San Diego County Chapter. I'm here representing our 2,000 due-paying members uh, in the county, uh, many of whom live in Oceanside, just like myself. Um, and we are also here in support of Community Choice Energy. Um, we believe that this is a great pathway um, towards reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, which is in turn important for our local community's ocean health. Um, actions we'd like the council to take um, are to have EES consulting, uh, present the findings of the feasibility study at a future city council meeting um, that Oceanside partially funded. The report is very lengthy, about 190 pages. Um, so I think it's reasonable to have the experts come um, and explain what's in that report to us and the council. Um, we went to the trouble and cost to have the report made, so I think it's important that we at least hear it. Um, we also ask that Oceanside join Encinitas, Carlsbad, and Del Mar in funding a supplemental study with EES to look at the different governance models for C CCE. Uh, we need to know the options, risks, benefits, differences, and consequences um, of joining different joint power authorities in the region, whether that be San Diego's JPA, which is likely to form uh, the counties, or forming one here in North County. Um, thus, we'd like the council to adopt a resolution to fund Oceanside's share of that study. Um, this is important because it keeps Oceanside up to speed with our peer cities, uh, keeps us connected to the greater regional conversation and negotiations going on between the city of San Diego, the county, and others. Um, basically, we just want to make sure we still have a seat at the table. Um, so, thank you. And with that, we will adjourn to 3.30 Wednesday, March 13th.